Hello and welcome to Delicious of History, a podcast about interesting and important people you probably didn't learn about in school. My name is Fega and I'm one of your hosts and a public historian. Today's conversation is with the author Mac Little, who wrote the fantastic book Shelter in a Hostile World. Her book follows the life of Badu, a man enslaved on the island of Barbados in the 17th century. Badu is trying to escape and save his daughter after fomenting a slave revolt on the island. In the process, the reader learns about Barbados' complex class system of planters, farmers, indentured servants, and enslaved people. On this podcast, we usually discuss a specific historical figure, but because of the power dynamics of who writes history and what history tends to get the most attention, we don't really have an individual to work with today. Instead, we will be following the path of the fictional Badu. We will talk about the importance of class and racial solidarity in 17th century Barbados and today, and the importance of everyone seeing themselves as agents in their own history. A few content warnings. We did discuss female genital mutilation in very general terms. If you would like to skip this discussion, you can find the times to skip in the show notes. Additionally, we did have some technical difficulties, so I, I did everything I could to clean this up as best as I could, but please forgive any less than perfect audio. You could come with me, you could come with me. We have a guest today, Mac Little. Big welcome. Thank you for being on the program. Uh, thank you for having me. What inspired you to write about 17th century Barbados? I've always loved like romance novels and adventure novels, but there's never really a space for Black people, people of color. When I was watching like Black Sails or something, I saw the Maroons. And I, I hadn't learned about them in, in, in school. And when I went to Google and fell down the rabbit hole, I found out that these they were such a, a proud people. They were fierce. They were feared by the British. And they were autonomous. And they were integral to the economic system, especially in Jamaica, because in Spanish Jamaica, they were pretty much ignored by King Philip and the merchants, and they were able to uh, aid in their obtaining, you know, goods and luxuries uh, through smuggling. Yeah, they worked closely with the buccaneers and the pirates. And so I'm like, wait, you know, there there's a space for people of color on a pirate ship having a swashbuckling adventure. There's space for them to have romance. Looking, doing my research for this episode, most of what I sort of learned as a history person was like, the Caribbean was a terrible, terrible place. And that was kind of the the whole of my knowledge. So going into this, it was really, um, it was really great. Like it was just, <laughs> it was so fun to read up about. It was interesting because it initially was a little challenging to find stuff that was in this specific niche of 17th century Barbados. So usually on this, like I said, in our email, we usually do specific people. I did find a specific person from 1692 uprising, but it just seemed like that didn't quite fit into like the era of the novel. Like things had changed so much by the 1690s. So that's why we're sort of looking more generically at, at what was going on in Barbados. When you Google, if you like just type in like, Slave Rebellion Barbados. What pops up is 1670 Busa's Rebellion. Quick correction, Busa's Rebellion happened in 1816. Mm-hmm. And that was really frustrating for me because I was like, no, I put 17th century. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is wrong. And I, yeah. I, I think it really is interesting you're talking about that finding space because it was difficult to find, not impossible, but it was, it was not a simple matter to find this information and it is a fantastic story and it's really a story of like i'm not sure what the word is i know like agency there we go Ah, (laughs) yeah (laughs) it was like there's there's agency there that in a lot of like typical white narratives isn't there 
that was uh, I ended up finding a fantastic article by Jerome Handler from the 1980s that was really, really helpful for me. What was the research process like for you diving into the sort of depths of this world that your characters lived in? So I, I started with the character and you know, I knew that I wanted him, I wanted him to be like a strong person with agency and as I he I had him as a minor character in my previous novel, uh, Daughter of Hades. And as I formed the character, I'm like, well, what is his history? I kinda um made him a, an amalgamation of two historical persons. Uh, and one was when I first developed the character, He, I was thinking of Black Caesar. He was mm -hmm. a pirate on a slave. Well, actually he was, a, he was on a slave ship. He was captured, but he befriended one of the sailors and he and the sailor together rebelled and took over the ship. And so like you had, uh, this white guy and this black guy, like, mm -hmm. you know, joining forces and becoming pirates. I use that story to underpin uh, Baidu's relationship with a buccaneer, how that formed. And so when I was looking at his life in, in Barbados, I'm like, well, okay, so he fomented a revolution to rescue his daughter. Well, you know, like you, I Google what revolutions were there and there was Busa. Busa is really the only one that, you know, that really sticks out. And so I kind of, I based him on Busa revolution and I, it was hard to find anything on Busa. I found scholarly journals, found out that he was an overseer, a slave overseer. And so, yeah, I just kind of, I just kind of picked what I could from what I could learn about Busa and that revol uh, revolution, revolt, I'm sorry, and just kind of took some literary literary license <laughs> yeah literary license and and kind of cut and pasted it and put it in into Badu's character it was really important to show how he came to be a slave as well as how he he left slavery so that became one of the focal points yeah yeah very much so like how so I guess I should have said this from the beginning so the book takes place in two different time frames Part of the book base, takes place in 1651 in Barbados, which was a really important moment of change in Barbados. I'm going to talk about later. And in Igbo land? Uh, Ig yeah, Igbo land. Igbo land. Yeah, sorry. That process of how Badu became enslaved. I really loved how someone could really learn about what both those societies were like from reading your book. I think that was the thing that floored me the most because I think a lot of times when I think of historical fiction, it's like, it's mostly right, but like there's a lot of license and, but it was the, 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 the setting was like that, that is accurate. Like that, that is what that world looked like in both cases, which was really just, I loved it as a history person. It made me oh, cry. Wow. I was crying in a cafe at the end of the book. <laughs> oh, my gosh, oh, that's beautiful. This guy um, next to me is trying to ask me about my Kindle, and I'm like, give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. It was, it was important to me to show pre-colonial Africa as accurately as possible, to show the beauty of it, and to show the traditions and the culture, because a lot of people, and they have good intentions. It's like, you know, at least we we rescued you from Africa, you know, and that primitive way of living. I'm like, it wasn't it wasn't primitive. They had they had a strong culture and you know, they had agency and I want to show that. I want to show I want people to learn about the culture and understand that we did not come from nothing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, far from it. And there was so much in the book of like there was a, a really important I don't want to spoil too much. There's a really important character who is incredibly powerful in that in that space who is a woman. And that wasn't abnormal at all. No. No. In my in my books and in both my books, I you know, I, I've come across instances of safe sex marriages in Igbo land. If a father dies without a son to inherit, a woman becomes a husband wife. She inherits his property. She marries what she marries women 
and she picks partners to mate with his, her wives so that they can have more, you know, have descendants and um, yeah. And I, th- I just thought that was very interesting. As a husband wife, she had a place in the Igbo society that was on the same level as men. Even, I mean, higher than I think most of the men in the novel. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, yeah, because of uh, some finagling of a character trying to, you know, get his way yeah. with her daughter. So, yeah, he gave her some incentive. And, yes. and she ended up being, yeah, placed above the other men. And I also really liked you didn't shy away from the the ugliness that exists in all societies. Yeah. You know, nothing's perfect. It wasn't like a, like, beautiful Eden like landscape. I, it was. I, I really loved how it showed the society on its own terms. It was just like, here it is. This is how it works. This is what it is. That's it. This is just what it is. And we're going to exist in this world at this moment with these characters. A, a lot of times when I was doing my research, and I used to, I used a lot of scholarly journals for for my sources, and it was really hard to find something some information that wasn't biased yeah in the novel we look at female circumcision and you know i certainly am against it i think it's horrible but in their society is something girls sport to us becoming women it it was i want to show it objectively right and also like this is always the struggle i think for a lot of like minority communities is there's this expectation that like it has to be perfect because it but it's because if you look at the genital mutilation doesn't or female genital mutilation doesn't exist in european society but you these european characters who are doing absolutely like horrific like wildly horrific things to people yes Mm -hmm. so it's like every society has this stuff exactly exactly yeah so i just thought it was important to be to approach it from their point of view as mm-hmm. as closely as I could imagine it. And one of the things I was really curious about that and something that bothered me was that the idea of people being sold into slavery, black people, Africans selling other Africans into slavery. In the time period my my story occurs, it was mostly they were selling prisoners, mm-hmm. you know, into slavery. No, Badu committed this terrible crime, and he was sold into slavery because of that. And I wanted, I wanted to look at that. And, and the book gives a peek at how he comes to slavery. And subsequent books I'm writing now talk about how you know greed took over, and how the disputes between the ethnic groups were exploited by the Europeans to to get more uh, slaves. Use the words like monkey. So coming back to Barbados, like I said, there was this was a moment of big change in Barbados, namely sugarcane. So it began when I said that my sort of just sort of vague, I've studied American history knowledge of the Caribbean was it was terrible. The it was terrible was because of sugarcane. Sugarcane cultivation is is a very labor intensive practice, not just labor intensive, but dangerous. It's so hopefully at this point surprising to no one <laughs> that that chattel slavery was an incredibly violent, incredibly violent system. And the violence of that was perhaps even more in the Caribbean, in part because of sugar. And just, I don't know, just reading about the the planters, they just, they weren't trying to like make it genteel in the way that later on the American South would try to. There was no gentility here. There was no pretending at gentility. And it's horrible and violent. And I'm wondering uh, what went into your decision-making process of how much of this violence to include in it and in what way, because it's, you know, a part of the story. But uh, there's, there's a, um, I know as a, as a t- when I'm tour guiding, it's always like, at what point are you crossing the line into trauma porn? 
Right. And yeah. yeah. So I was wondering how what what went into that process? How did you decide like how much to include? Because there is some in here. And I thought it was well done. I didn't think it was gratuitous at all. I did not want to sugarcoat slavery, the difficulties, the pain uh, that that enslaved people faced in that society. I just didn't want to sugarcoat it because I thought that would be dishonoring, you know, what my ancestors went through. And, but at the same time, that isn't the focus of my story. The focus of my story is showing Black people with agency and working, you know, in the margins and finding, you know, a living there and finding their space and combating the the prevailing cultural and economic system. That's where my focus is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the other stuff happened. And sometimes the people living in the margins were in danger of being sucked into the horrors of slavery, well, into the horrors, period. And mm -hmm. I just, I, so I just want to be realistic. I didn't want to sugarcoat it and make it, because I've, I've read some, some historical romance novels and, and I'm trying to write a romance. Right. <laughs> and it's so gritty and, and kind of realistic. I don't, I don't know if I'm successful in the romance department, but I've read historical romances and I just kind of gloss over yeah. you know, the slavery and, you know, the difficulties. I didn't want to do that. I just, I just want yeah, to it. no, and yeah. it's important as actually I was just the last recording we did was I talked to somebody who uh, wrote a book about medieval life. And that's always an interesting thing of, for me as a Jewish person going to Ren Faire. I love Ren Faire. I, I, I love buying the whole turkey leg, whatever. But <laughs> there is a very real reality of like my ancestors were <laughs> that was not a fun, happy time to exist. Yeah, uh, I was I was doing research for another novel where. You know, periodically, Jews were accused of poisoning the well in uh, France in the Loire Valley. And, yeah, I was going to write a story about that. Yeah. <laughs> Sidetracked. <laughs> yeah. So going into researching the that era, the, 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 the racial and class interactions in this moment in Barbados are not just a simple white and black. Right. right. And it... I, I love that that was super in your book. And also, like, I wouldn't have thought anything of it if you had been like, nah, we're not doing that. But, like, I was really excited that it was all, it was, like, it was just that complexity was there. So you had the, you had the planters who were, well, there's different kinds of planters. So you have the, when you think plantation planters, who are exactly what probably the listeners are thinking of. Like, these are, like, very wealthy people who have all the power. And then you have farmers who are like poorer farmers who are, I believe, usually white and British as well. And then you have indentured servants that are mostly Irish. And then, of course, you have the enslaved people from different places in Africa. This was part of the, the article I read. A big part of what this particular journal article was looking at was that this article is a little old. And what it was pushing against was this idea that like in the 17th century that the enslaved people were just sort of like there you know, and that they weren't fighting back against the system, which is wildly inaccurate. Yes. I, I think what made it, what makes it complicated for people who have a certain idea of what society looks like under European colonialism and enslavement is Barbados was complicated. Your character, like, he wasn't just working with the other people who were enslaved. He was working with Irish indentured servants. He was working with, I believe he, there, there was a mention that during his, his uprising, he was working even with white farmers who just weren't the plantation owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely really, really an interesting thing. A lot of where the knowledge I found came from was this guy, Richard Lingen, who is a white man living on Barbados from 1647 to 1650. One of the things that he talked about, he talked about some obnoxious stuff because, you know, he was a white guy from Europe living on Barbados in <laughs> the 17th century. So most of it was kind of messed up. But one thing that was actually a useful observation was that the people who were kidnapped from Africa weren't just from one place. And so there was this additional hurdle of language acquisition. Yes. 
yeah. because people couldn't communicate with each other. And that was a big part of your book was language acquisition. Badu, when he comes when he comes to Barbados, he uh, is befriended by an Irish woman, and eventually, you know, they get married, and she she teaches him English, and that helps. That actually helps him to get ahead and to get his position as a driver or overseer. And as a as an overseer or driver, he had a lot of agency because he brokered deals between the plantations and he he ran the slaves. He had a lot of contact with slave owner. Yeah, I know there wasn't really a question in there. It's just sort of like, no. I just... <laughs> yeah, I just want to, yeah, I just, yeah, I'm agree- agreeing with you. But it, yeah. it was really important, his evolution to his position, his top position on the plantation. Yeah, and another group, I, I'm scrolling through my notes, another group that I failed to mention were that that this this moment of sugarcane really impacted too uh, was the number of people who had been enslaved who escaped and were living in as I it sort of seemed like they were living like in small groups just out in the woods in caves and things like that just trying to keep basically just like keep away from this entire system and that became I mean that was always it was always difficult but the difficulty went up one one of the interesting things that I found when I was uh, studying uh, maroons in the Caribbean, maroons existed, you know, anywhere s- slavery existed, and Barbados is such a small island. They they didn't have very many places to go, so they they lived in the forest or the most likely the caves. But a lot of a lot of them just went from plantation to plantation and. You know, that was how they existed. And I had a couple of characters that, that exemplified that way of life, that type of maroonage. Yeah. And that was a big part of as we as, as one looks at the various various points when the planters, this, this article calls it the plantocracy, which I kind of liked when they get freaked out, which happened sort of every 10 years or so. <laughs> one of the things they went after a lot was that freedom of movement. And trying to keep the enslaved people from from traveling to other plantations because they, you know, accurately assessed that this was, you know, how people were were organizing and interacting with each other. It got to a point where I'm trying to find the year because I know it's a little further in my thing. I think it was the 1670s where they like, like the enslaved people couldn't play drums. They couldn't make music. They couldn't do anything. And they went after the Quakers, which is I, being a Philadelphia person. I'm always like, oh, Quakers. The Quakers are fascinating because they're like, we believe everyone is equal, but we're okay with enslaving people at this point for some reason. I don't know. It took them a sec to get it together. But they were bringing people, to, their enslaved people to Sunday meeting, which made the Anglicans very upset. You talked about the movement of the characters. Badu was able to move around because of his his status. And also, something interesting I found that the revolution was usually carried out by slaves who were in high positions, like mm-hmm. Badu, because they're close enough to slave owners to see the dis- disparity. Yeah, so they saw, they saw like how they were living and were like, this is, no. They had confidence in their own intellect and, you know, they knew themselves and they saw the disparity, the, disparity, the way they were treated and what they had. And so they kind of uh, instigated the revolts. And that was that was an interesting thing to find out. It wasn't usually the, the enslaved persons working out in the fields. It was the higher ups that had yeah. privilege, but they wanted more. They wanted freedom. So, so. Yeah. And it. One of the other things that in, uh, I think it was the 1670s, might have been the 1680s, where the plantocracy started trying to limit Irish indentured servants from coming to the island. And I suspect that that's connected to that of having like, when you have some privilege, you can see that disparity that's there. And they, the, the yeah. Irish saw themselves as more in line, it seemed with the enslaved people from Africa. They, they did, did the they did. And, and it was a real threat to, to the plantation owners. And that's around this time, 
I based by this character and his relationship with the Irish indentured servant uh, was based on a couple that was in Virginia. A black slave or, or a slave person married an indentured servant, and they really didn't know how to handle that, that relationship. And uh, that came the, I can't say this word, miscegenation. Oh, mis mi yeah, same. Miscegenation. Yeah. Mis <laughs> miscegenation. But actually, they did relate to each other, the Irish and the, the Africans, and they joined together in the revolts. And so they put these laws into place, the miscegenation yeah. <laughs> <That one. laughs> laws and, and the um, interacting laws, and they put the Irish above the slaves and gave them, you know, uh, more privilege to divide, the cl divide them up into classes so that they wouldn't join together kind of pitted them against each other so that yeah well um, that's the old story right i mean that's what we're seeing today and it's always seen is the people in power want to keep the people not in power separated in any way they possibly can and it's pretty effective unfortunately so a lot of and what was also changing this was these smaller white farmers were moving eventually moved off the island because it was just so hard to compete with the plantocracy. A lot of them ended up in like South Carolina. This is something another thing comes up tour guiding that I think if more if everyone reads this book, they will understand a little better is the the difference. You know, we've talked a lot about the similarities and the solidarity between the Irish indentured servants and the enslaved people. But there was a, a massive, important difference between the experiences of those two groups. And it's one that I have noticed a lot of white Americans don't entirely understand, which is, of course, indentured servitude generally ends at some point. And it certainly doesn't get passed on to children. We've been mostly been talking about like the actual historical record and how it connects to your book, which it connects super well. I just want to say again, you did a really good job at that. One thing, though, that was it's not outside the historical record. It's just different is the role of spirituality and the supernatural, if that's the right word to use yeah. in the book. So another character of sorts is a duppy, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about duppies and who they are like in, in I guess, in both contexts, like it, it, it both in, in, in our real life and how they exist in your book? Okay. Uh, so duppies are spiritual creatures that, you know, can incarnate and they usually exist to take revenge or on the people who have wronged them in life. And... So I use that as a finding retribution for, well, first to, in the opening of the book, I went to, they're, they're there to take the retribution for this lady who had helped and torture so many enslaved kids. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I thought, I thought that was an important part of their culture and also, uh, I enjoy horror, and so I thought that would be fun to include. And it, it's, I don't know, I just found it interesting, and I just want to uh, include that in the book and into the spirituality and, and you know, maybe have them help, help out my characters a bit. And as I was doing my research, I realized that, you know, when I was growing up, we had these figures that that were essentially duppies, but I just, we didn't call them that. When we were growing up, our parents would tell us, you know, you better get in by dark or low booty's going to get you. <laughs> and low booty was the name of a duppy and he would, you know, <laughs> that yeah. he would come in. Yeah. And so I, I just think it was just a important, cool part of our culture that, you know, a lot of people didn't know about and and they didn't see and I just wanted people to see the correlation that you know who were like me who grew up like me yeah you know you presented them in a way that was I I didn't know anything about 
about it and I felt like I understood what was happening and who they were. I mean, I was explaining, it's, it's interesting how this exists across cultures. I was explaining this to my wife. I was like, yeah, they're, and I was like trying, I was like searching for like trying to explain who they were. And she was like, they're Dybbix. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, <laughs> except they don't live in a box. Um, <laughs> but like, it's just cool how these things are cross culture. But one thing I don't want to, without spoiling anything, you, I also really like you used duppies or a specific duppy to sort of, is he seems, seems sort of like a metaphorical following of Badu. They thought was really neat. Is is that what you intend? I mean, that's how I read it. Besides, obviously, he's literally there too because it's you know in the context of the book. But I'm I'm wondering if that was part of how how you were envisioning it as well. So it was definitely something I read into it. It and it to me it was it was a metaphor for his conscience for doing the for committing this really violent and horrific act, and it. It also represents what he lost in um, Igbolan before he became enslaved. It, it, it represents his loss, his guilt, regret for being, for selling himself into slavery. Yeah, he's a metaphor for a lot of things that are going on in, in, in Badu's subconscious. Yeah, it's definitely, I'm, I'm looking forward to giving it a reread because there's definitely like, there's a lot of mystery around that character. I mean, I look forward to reading it again and kind of following, now that I know, <laughs> following what, what he was doing. Yeah, so for any listeners, this is a part of history that I think certainly Americans who just, you know, go to normal public school or whatever, don't learn a lot about. But even like as someone with a BA in history, Unless you take a like class that is specifically about the Caribbean, this is a this is a place that gets like skimmed over. Like thinking back to my history education, like I don't think a class that would have covered this material was even offered. And my my college, like, you know, like I took, you know, classes about every continent, basically, like, you know, <laughs> like, and uh, I don't think this was an option. It's a. I think it sometimes gets sort of smushed up into like the story of the American South, but it is different and it's worth looking into on, on its own basis. Exactly. And I don't think it should be like separated as a special course. I mean, mm -hmm. the lives of the black people and the white people were so entwined and, mm -hmm. and symbiotic and, whatever they were so entwined how can you separate how can you not tell how can you tell one story and not tell the other right and so I, I just think there should be more of a, a melding of history and so if anybody's listening and wants sort of like a where they should look it's like we talked a little bit about how this is this particular era was is a little bit challenging to find stuff on but there's definitely like places you can look to start learning about this time and place. I know I have some ideas of where I would recommend, but I'd love to hear what what you have. I'm sorry, I've like struck. <laughs> I mean, like sort of like what what sh what what should the Google terms be? You know, like like I'm thinking oh. like the uh, Haitian Revolution. If people don't know about that, do that. That is huge. Or you can, yeah, you can type my 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 auto uh, feel. Is like 17th century Caribbean. And then you can add in, you know, whatever terms, maroons, slavery, islands, whatever. I also recommend if you have a library card, they libraries generally have an electronic access to digital journals, and you can search across those. Those are great resources. JSTOR. Yes. JSTOR was love J store. Yeah. <laughs> that was my jam. That's where I got a lot of my information. That's how that helped me put the story together. So when I was trying to uh, fill in Badu's history. Yeah, I um, am very upset because my library just ended our electronic access to J store. Also, Google Scholar is a good, mm -hmm. a good resource. The Internet Archive. Yes. Get full free full text. And when I was re uh, researching the Duppies, there's a site called Sacred Text, and it has the full text of 
uh, all these religious mm-hmm. doctrines or whatever. That it, it had the full text of it. And they they had stories about duffies and their origin and how to defend against duffy, duffies. You have to bury someone, you know, a particular way. <laughs> yeah. So they don't come back. Yeah. And uh, if anybody is, is un, unaccustomed to peer-reviewed articles, I would – don't be scared of them. They're – especially in, in the social science and history, they're not – they're more often than not, they're very readable. Occasionally, you get somebody who's like – thinks very highly of themselves and uses every SAT word they can think of um, and sentences that like span half of a page. But that's, I think, more the exception than the rule, at least in my experience. Maybe I'm just looking for things that tend to be a little more accessible. And also, I have I have a blog that you know I try to flesh, uh, you know, give more information about things that I write about that you know you might be. Curious. I have a whole blog on duppies and, and explains yeah what they are, how to defend them, you know, where they live and all that. And yeah, so it's it's kind of like my extended author's note. Yeah, send me that link and I'll definitely put drop it in the show notes. As I think this is important for people to look into because even those of us who are very have been engaged in history education for a long time, it is if we're even taught about this stuff, it's usually not from the perspective of black people having agency. It's very much white and then yeah, not white. <laughs> that made research so difficult for me because everything was from how everything affected the Europeans and it, it really wasn't how it affected us or wh- where we came from. And that, that was very, it was very challenging to get that information. To a lot of out. reading between the lines because you can't just assume that what the people wrote down was right. Cause it was just, they're not a reliable narrator. Right. Is there anything else that I didn't touch on that you think is important for listeners to understand when they think about this era? I think we hit the main points. Um, you know, our we had a culture that existed, and there was, and there was a, a certain equality between men, a balance between men and women, and and their relationships before the colonizers came in, introduced Christianity, which really disrupted the harmony of the society that we that we had created. Yeah, it makes me sad today to see how Christian Christianity has taken root in Africa and they they use the tenets of Christianity to uh, subjugate women so mm-hmm. terribly. You know, it's, it's more like it's more like women are enslaved to their husbands and they use Christian scripture to do it. And it's, it's I just, yeah. I just feel like they infected Africa. <laughs> I mean, the legacy of colonialism is vast, I guess. I would love to see how we would have progressed without their influence. I just, I think, I think we could have, we could have been something a lot better. And I just think it's that they try to emulate Western society and instead of, uplifting the harmony that they mm-hmm. that they had with the environment and with each other and that's just not there anymore yeah well i don't i don't know how to transition out of that I'm sorry. um so <laughs> so thank you so much for coming and talking about this this was i was so when i saw this on the list of potential things i was really excited about it because I was like oh I don't know anything about this like yeah this is gonna be so much fun go ahead and plug all of your all of your things where can Um, people find you okay so I I have a website it's mac m-a-c-k hyphen little dot com if you go to that site if you would uh, there's a place for you to order signed copies of shelter in a hostile world and uh, the previous novel uh, daughter of Hades I'm on Amazon. I have a blog in medium.com. Just search Mac Little. It'll, it'll bring up all of my articles. I'm on Facebook. And uh, I'm on Instagram at Zen Baby. I don't really deal with X anymore. I have an yeah. account there, but I haven't updated it in, in a long time. So, Yeah, I'm not even bothered. We, we This podcast started about a year ago, and I was just like, I'm not even 
I'm not even going to deal with that. Um, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's, just, it's just too messy. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah. And thank you for writing this book. Everyone should, should read it. It's super great. And it is, if you are trying to expand your knowledge of outside of what the sort of standard American history education is, this is a really, really great place to start. Thank you so much for listening to D-Listers of History. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe and drop us a review on whatever platform you listen on. We are a weekly podcast. Next Monday, January 29th, we will release a sidebar episode where we will discuss the history surrounding some current event that's hit the headlines. Our next full episode will drop Monday, February 5th. I will chat with the actor Robert Newmark Jones, who, among other things, starred in the West End production of One Jewish Boy. We will discuss the first Jewish Commodore in the U.S. Navy and all-around delightful loudmouth Uriah Levy. D-Listers of History is a member of the World Podcast Network. Head over to nycpodcastnetwork.com and give this episode a like to help our rankings. Go to our show notes for links to our various social media pages and website. We would love to chat with you. A big thank you to our Patreon members. We couldn't do this without your wonderful help and encouragement. Coming up on Patreon, keep an eye out for a read-along of sorts of the first chapter of Mac Little's book with me. And now for an episode-relevant audio drop. Got everything you need. There's plenty to do, or you can just sit.